Hello and welcome to this video in which we are going to analyze some of the movements of the technique of Kyuhi Park. Kyuhi Park is one of my favorite guitarists to listen to. I think she's absolutely amongst the best of the best in the classical guitar world. But I also use her as an important example with students because from time to time I will have a student come in and they will say something along the lines of, you know, blah, 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 but I can't do that because my hands aren't big enough. And every time I hear that, I say, really? And then I say, you know, there's this one guitarist that you should listen to and you should watch. And I show them Kyuhi Park. And of course, they hear her play and they say, oh, she's amazing. She sounds amazing. And I said, yeah. And also, did you notice the size of her hands? Because 95% of the time, whoever is complaining to me about having small hands has hands that are not as small as Kyuhi Parks. And it can be an easy thing to do as a guitarist to complain about the size of your hands. And it's something that I've done a lot, something that I've seen other people do a lot. But I think she is very inspiring in that aspect. It's something that has not held her back whatsoever. And she simply just has to adhere to a different set of disciplines. You know, she can't play the way that somebody with larger hands would play, she has to do things differently. And we're going to look at a number of things that she approaches differently uh, based on her anatomy. But first things first, I want to take a quick look at her sitting position because this is always something that I take note of when watching somebody play. And here we have some good shots of her sitting position and it's very traditional. Uh, she uses a footstool under the left foot and rest the guitar on the left leg and has kind of a you know a typical medium-ish level of elevation to the neck something at you know 45-ish degree angle somewhere around there she does have a pretty high elevation on the footstool it looks like the footstool is maxed out plus she usually is wearing some uh, pretty killer set of heels when she plays as well so it's like high footstool plus another several inches, looks like it to me. Although uh, I've never worn heels myself. But it does look like that would give you uh, even more lift. So very traditional approach there. And then the only other thing I wanted to mention about how she holds the guitar is in this shot, you can see the angle at which the guitar leans back into her body. She's sitting up pretty much upright, but you can see the guitar is not. It's not sitting strictly vertically on top of her left leg, it's leaning back into her son. And I think this is very important. You don't really get this sometimes when you look at the front or it's hard to tell, you know, how far is the guitar leaning back? It, it kind of just looks like it's just sitting straight up. But in my experience, it does give a whole different feel if it's leaning back some and how far it's leaning back. So that leads me to believe that people that can play the way that she can, they utilize that very specific angle of the guitar leaning into the body. So now moving on to a lot to talk about, about her left hand technique. So this is where I feel like I see a lot of things done differently, just kind of a different approach in general that she utilizes to play the repertoire that she plays. And she plays big time repertoire you know she plays all kinds of music she plays a lot of barrios music and you know if you want to find a barrios piece that's not very challenging on the left hand you know good luck with that uh, especially the popular pieces uh, they are extremely challenging bar chords stretches bar chords plus stretches okay all kinds of things all over the place so i want to start talking about all the different factors that come into play uh, when she is utilizing her left hand technique, starting with the fretboard hand thumb. So here are some really cool shots from, you know, the other side of the guitar. And these can be very informative when, when we're looking at somebody's technique, because most of the time you don't see this shot and it just gives a lot of good information 
uh, that you may not even know. Some people do all kinds of weird stuff, you know, going on behind the guitar that you just don't even ever see. So what you see here is her left hand thumb just being extremely active and versatile. She moves it all over the back of the neck and utilizes it in a number of different ways. Sometimes the thumb stays right around the middle of the back of the neck. Sometimes it goes up towards the top and even peeking out a bit like above the top of the neck. Uh, there's just one shot here where she has like a fuller grip of the neck. So, you know, usually you see this space between her hand and the back of the neck. But in this shot, you don't see any. It's like she's she's utilizing something else where she needs uh, more grip, moves forward a bit, and all that space disappears. And you can see a few instances here where it looks like she's doing a bit of vibrato. And to achieve that, she just lets go of the thumb, which is something that you'll see uh, some players do. And so she's completely thumb free in these moments to uh, give some nice vibrato uh, with the left hand. But the most interesting thing I think is here where she does this kind of side thumb thing. It looks like her thumb, instead of the back of the fingertip of the thumb being pressed against the neck, she kind of turns the hand to the side and it's more the side. And then you can see this slight bend in the tip joint, which shows the thumb is slightly bent and the side of it is pressing against the neck more than the flatness of the thumb. Now I want to get into more on the other side, uh, the fingerboard side of the guitar and what's going on with the technique of the fretboard hand fingers. So one of the things I noticed right away about Kyuhi Park is that she is one of these players who has a fourth finger that just works differently. It works differently than any of her other three fingers do on that hand. And I noticed that, you know, for instance, in this passage here, I think she's playing Mertz. And I wanted to find a shot of, you know, basic scale playing that was pretty much in a box position. So you're gonna have four frets and each finger polices, you know, each of the four frets, that type of position. Because in her hand, even that type of position, it's like a stretch. For most any other player, they would only do a move like this if they had to stretch. But even when she plays something in box position, it's a stretch. Her fourth finger can't come in you know, curled and go straight down like the other fingers because I suppose it wouldn't be able to reach. So you can see here, even when she's just playing stuff in box position, the fourth finger has to operate differently. It sticks way out, it's very straight. And instead of being curled and coming down, it sticks out flat and then kind of has a waving motion as it comes down from the top. And as we look at some other clips, that's just what we see over and over. And a lot of the times when the fourth finger isn't in use, it sticks straight up. It flagpoles is what I call it, the flagpole. <laughs> and that's really interesting because, you know, as a teacher, you might see that and say, well, you know, you need to keep that fourth finger relaxed and you're adding tension when, when it's not doing anything. So you need to get that out of, out of your hand. But the way that she utilizes it is extremely effective because in most instances, it's not gonna be able to come down and be curled like the other fingers. It's gonna have to reach. And it just looks like this is part of her basic fretboard hand technique. So instead of it, you know, being in a shape that it's not gonna be able to be in when she's actually fretting, it's like it's already in that shape. It just happens to be sticking up. And then when she needs to bring it down, well, she just brings it down and it's very accurate. The amazing thing to me is how accurate she is with it because when you're talking about distances on the guitar, I mean, you're talking about centimeters, really. 
So if you're adding centimeters, you're adding a significant amount of distance. But in a lot of these clips, she just sticks her fourth finger straight up in the air when it's not in use. And so when it has to come down, I mean, that is inches away from the guitar. But it just goes to show that she has built this seamlessly into her technique that she can use it that way and be razor sharp accurate in using her pinky this way. And I think this is really interesting in this clip here. She's not really using her fourth finger, but you can see just kind of how it lives and thus kind of how her hand position exists. And this is what is natural. It's not natural to have the fourth finger curled and being more in that position. If it's not being used, it's just kind of flagpoling. It's just kind of hanging out. And then as soon as she does need it, it just whips down and it is just as accurate as can be. Something else that I noticed that she utilizes that is you know, a big no-no for some guitarists, <laughs> especially if you teach guitar, uh, a lot of people say don't do this, uh, is she bends her tip joints of her fretboard hand. And she will bend any and all of them if she needs to. So here are some shots of her playing, uh, I think this is Barrios, and some tricky, stretchy chord shapes going on here. And you can see her bending the, the joints, the tip joints of the second and third fingers to get these stretchy chords. And in my own experience, I can definitely feel there's something that it feels like it releases. Like if you're trying to stretch and reach with the fourth finger, but you're keeping your third finger very curled, if I bend that tip joint, it's like something releases and I feel like I can stretch further more comfortably. It doesn't feel as strenuous. So I think it definitely lends itself to some kind of advantage when you're just trying to reach something. The interesting thing about this to me is that I do believe you don't ever want a tip joint to collapse if you don't want it to. If you want it to be firm and it collapses, it's going to cause you to mess up. Okay, it's going to throw you off. It's going to be like a shaky foundation, right? So that means you're gonna have to train all your tip joints to be firm basically all the time. But then after that, to train them to say, well, but when I need you to, I need you to break this rule and then be flexible. That's just like a whole different level of discipline because now you're saying, yeah, this rule that I always tell you to adhere to, yeah, I need you to do that, but except sometimes I need you to not do it. And in those instances, I actually need you to do the opposite. So I think it just shows a ton of control that she has over the tip joints. In this shot here, she's playing uh, some more barrios. I think this is the, the tremolo piece with all the different names. <laughs> I call it una limosnita, but it has a bunch of different names. And it has this one gnarly stretch towards the end, so you can see her utilizing this technique, especially with the first finger in this instance. I mean, that's a pretty fierce back bend almost between the tip of the finger and the middle joint. So she's bending the joint of the first finger here, the tip joint there, to get this vicious stretch uh, for the Barrios piece. And this last shot here regarding the tip joints, uh, this is earlier on in that same Barrios tremolo piece. And I just thought this was really interesting because I call it something like a joint reset, okay? So this is a very stretchy chord shape. So first of all, you can see she's got the tip joint bending of the first three fingers going on, right? Fourth finger is sticking straight out. Uh, very elevated wrist as well on the fingerboard hand. This is something that she does a lot. The wrist comes out to make these big types of stretches. And a lot of players, if they have bigger hands, you know, they don't ever do this move with the wrist. But other people that need to find different ways to reach things, this is, this is one of the ways that you can do it. Bring the wrist out to extend the fingers. But she starts this shape 
by having the first and second and third fingers, all those tip joints are, are bent, right? And then she resets the third finger. She kind of lets go and then she comes back down and refrets it. And this time, I don't know, there's like a slight wiggle. So I wonder if she's feeling it out. Maybe it didn't feel quite as secure the first time or maybe it's about what, what is coming next, I don't know. But now she's refretted it, and now that tip joint, it looks like it's firm. It's not collapsed, uh, which is just interesting. And then she goes on and, and maintains that shape uh, for the next few seconds until she, she changes chords. But just an interesting little moment there. We've seen other players kind of do something like wiggle their tip joints, and it just makes me wonder what they're thinking about. Are they feeling it out? Uh, are they people that do this technique and they're maybe they're possibly torn between the two? I'm not sure which one to do or um, Is it just a feel thing? I don't know, but I thought it was a really interesting moment uh, Seeing what she does here and resetting that tip joint of the third finger Now uh, still talking about the fingerboard hand technique, but looking at other mechanisms going on you know, I think this is the 10th video in this technique analysis series and so far I have not seen anybody with near as much elbow and shoulder movement as Cutie Park. So this shot here I like uh, for this reason. This video, uh, which all the links to all these videos are in the description by the way, I think this one is called like Old Folk House Concert or something. Really cool. And she sets up in this a beautiful looking house and they get some really amazing shots so this one is interesting it maybe it's on a drone or something it's coming in from far away so you can't really see anything except you can see one thing moving all about and that's her elbow so you can even see from far away how much elbow and arm movement that she has and it is apparently a huge part of her fretboard hand technique so as you watch her, she will just move it in what looks like all directions. You know, she will move it away from her body where it's really sticking out kind of far away. She'll move it in towards her body where it's really close. Uh, and then she'll even move it, um, you know, back in towards her. And even sometimes wiggle it side to side in, in some ways. But the movement is very, uh, it's almost like a ballet dancer. They're very refined movements and they have a lot of grace, like choreography. And although I can't really say, you know, here's what she's doing with her elbow and her shoulder, there are a couple times where I see her use it, looks like to a big advantage that she does consistently. One of the ways is she really leads her left hand with her shoulder and elbow. So there will be the sequence of events that happens if she's moving from a higher position and then shifting to a lower position. So she'll be fretting the chord in the upper position. And then while she's still fretting that chord, she begins to move her elbow to her left towards the lower position. So the elbow is already going in that direction. Then she lets go with her fingers. And as she lets go, now the hand starts to move in that same direction towards the lower position. As the hand gets to the lower position, the elbow actually moves back some in towards her body, almost like you know a very gentle whip. So the elbow leads the movement. Then as the hand gets there, the elbow comes back. It's like everything's on a swivel almost. So really interesting. The other way I noticed that she uses it that I can't really describe, but I just, I saw it happen consistently is she will use her elbow when she's in like the same chord position or a very similar place on the fingerboard. So in other words, sometimes she will move to a position and then land there so she'll be playing in that position and after she gets there she will move her elbow after that so it's like it makes it even more strong or just gives her a better angle i'm not sure 
or sometimes she just kind of wiggles it back and forth when she's not moving you know left or right across the fingerboard she's more staying in the same position so that just really looks like everything is on a swivel and considering the size of her hands you know I would guesstimate this is something that she probably couldn't do without and when you listen to her play I mean she's an incredibly strong player she doesn't sound like someone who has any physical disadvantages so maybe this is a way that she gets around that is by drawing strength and uh, accuracy from the elbow and the shoulder so I want to move on and talk about some things about her plucking hand but Kind of to transition our way there, here's an interesting little detail that I noticed. And this is a, one of those things where I'm like, is this even a thing? I don't know. But when you have a great player and you kind of imagine uh, all the details that they must think about and everything that goes into their approach, I kind of don't feel like there's anything that really is insignificant. So I noticed in one of the shots in these videos that she uses these little guitar beady things. Um, that is the technical name for them that I frequently use. Um, they're these little beads that you tie the strings with behind the tie block. And they're great. I use them on a lot of my guitars that have six hole bridges because I think they increase the resonance and I've, I've talked about that in other videos. I noticed that she has them, but she only has three of them. So, I then started to look for it in other shots and I always found the same thing. You know, word on the street is that she plays a Daniel Friedrich guitar, which uh, I have had the pleasure of playing a Friedrich and it is one of the two best guitars I've ever played in my life. It was absolutely phenomenal. And she almost exclusively is only playing this guitar. So it looks like this is definitely her instrument. And Every time I could see a shot of the bridge, she has these three beads only on the bass side, but not on the treble strings. So I just thought that was really peculiar. I've never really seen that before. I've never seen a player use these, but use only three. So I started to wonder, well, is it because of some kind of resonance balance where she wants that feel for the bass strings but not for the trebles you know the strings all kind of work together so maybe the bass is having these is enough maybe the trebles don't need them but then i also wondered it could be just to protect the tie block you know this is definitely a one-of-a-kind instrument so i imagine you'd want to do whatever you could to protect it and keep it from getting damaged and i know over the years if you have a six hole bridge and you tie the strings traditionally you know they're going to wrap around the tie block and they can do some damage to the top or at least it's possible so then i thought maybe it's just to protect it so that way the the wound strings aren't at all touching the tie block except inside but besides that they're not wrapping around the top and they're not going to damage it so i don't know the reason but i just thought that was a interesting little detail and i've never actually seen that before so now moving on to her plucking hand and some things that are happening here. So just a bit about general free stroke position. I did find one shot of this very dramatic looking video uh, in which she plays the Fuoco by Roland de Dion's. But they did get this one great shot that I think gives fantastic information about right hand plucking position. So a couple things I'll point out about just some basic free stroke principles that are happening. You know, for one, she never really struck me as having an elevated wrist. From all of the angles that you see of her from the front, I just never really got that impression. But you can see from here that she definitely does play with an elevated wrist. There's a nice arch to the wrist, and you know, not everybody plays this way, especially as the years go by, a lot of players, and it seems to be more and more players, come from a very flat wrist position. But she's not one of them. She has a nice curvature to the wrist. And then something else that really indicates this, I think, is how the thumb comes down. When the thumb can just kind of drop down and it's pointed towards the top, it just 
seems to lend itself to a lot of power and very easy power. You know, not that you have to you know, blast away the audience with every note, but you just don't need a lot of energy or effort and you make a very, a very nice stroke with the thumb. So that's an indicator of the, the strength coming from the tall wrist, it seems to me. And then the other thing that I noticed here is something that, you know, I'm seeing in many great players when they do free stroke is the roll of the middle joint. So you can really see it here, I think, in the I and M fingers, uh, mainly the I finger. But when she does a free stroke, of course, the big joint is activated, so the finger is gonna go back. But then you also see the middle joint coming out and then goes up a little bit. So she certainly seems like one of these players in which the middle joint plays a, a key role in the free stroke sound. And that is, it has a movement that goes out and up slightly uh, with each stroke. This is just something I noticed that I thought was interesting. I've seen guitar players do this from time to time. Some people do it a lot. Some people virtually never do it. And that is that they will throw their pinky out in certain finger combinations in order to, I suppose, help other fingers. You know, it's like the pinky isn't actually being used, it's not plucking anything, but it has a definite and consistent motion. So it is being used, it's just not being used to hit anything, it's being used to move and help out other fingers. So I think it's most obvious here in this shot, she is playing uh, some more barrios here. And I think the finger pattern here, there is an AMA free stroke on top, if I'm looking at this correctly. And in order to execute this, she throws out her fourth finger. And you can see as this little passage happens over and over, it so does the fourth finger get thrown out consistently and it's pretty far out there. I mean, it looks like it's almost totally straight when she throws it out. So the sequence of events to me, it kind of looks like A finger pluck, M finger pluck. Now the pinky comes out, then A finger pluck, something like that. And in this shot here, uh, she's playing tremolo and we're gonna talk a little bit about tremolo later on, but here I just want to say you can definitely see her fourth finger waving about. You can see a lot of movement. It looks like she must be playing on the first string because you see a decent amount of movement with the first finger, which is typical. You know, when you play on the first string, you can just be more free like that. But you also see a lot of movement in the pinky finger. So it's also really working. And it's obviously a very important part of her tremolo technique. So of course, I'm always interested in scale technique and the different things that different players do to execute their scales. So I found two instances here that I wanna talk about. The first one, I think is kind of what might be a basic example of how she might approach a typical scale. And then the second one is, is quite exceptional. Uh, but here she's playing the ending run to the popular Barrios waltz. And although this isn't exclusively I am alternation type of scale, it has slurs thrown in, uh, the technique that she uses to me looks like it's something that she likely would do in an exclusively alternating scale passage. And her approach here is pretty traditional, I guess you would say. So she has the long finger type of approach. You know, she doesn't do the changing of the hand position to shorten your fingers or make them more curled or anything like that. The fingers are pretty straight. And then she does anchor with the thumb. And the interesting thing about that is she starts out by anchoring on the fifth string, which you don't see quite as, as often. You do see people anchor on the sixth string a lot of people I've noticed that do that, they will pretty much always anchor on the sixth string. 
But as she starts at the top of the scale, she's anchoring on the fifth string. And then as she works her way down, the thumb just finagles its way to the sixth string and then uh, stays there for the rest of the scale. So that was kind of an interesting thing uh, with the anchoring of the thumb. And then we have this scale passage. And this happens in a Scarlatti Sonata. So I first saw this scale passage and I noticed that she did AMI on the top. And I thought, oh cool, I'll, I'll talk about that. You know, she starts out a scale with AMI and then does alternating. But then I looked at it and I thought, oh no, but then, but then she does something else. She changes techniques. And then I looked at it more and I thought, oh, and then she does something else. And there's actually a lot going on here. I count four different techniques in this one scale that is like just over an octave. So here's what I see going on. So she starts the scale on top with an AMI rest stroke. Then after that, she switches to IM alternation rest stroke for a few strokes, okay? But then this is where I got really excited. Then in the middle of that, she does a very sneaky eye drag. So some people will never do this. Uh, I'm one of them because I don't know how, <laughs> but some people only do alternation. Uh, but some people will throw in these little eye drags. So instead of going I to M, when you cross strings, she just goes I to I. So that is really interesting to do a few notes of alternation, but then for this one string crossing, you do the eye drag. But then after she does the eye drag, it's almost like she uses the drag to alter her hand position. And then she does the last few notes in the scale, I am free stroke. So quite a lot going on here and four different techniques in one scale. So an AMI rest stroke on top, followed by a few IM alternating rest strokes, then a double I drag string crossing, and then finishing it off with a few alternating IM free strokes. And then of course, this is Scarlatti. It's one of the uh, cadential passages that he does at the end of the section. So he's gotta say something and then he's gotta say it again, right? So you see her do the exact same fingering the second time as she does the first time. She changes color a little bit, but she executes the scale in the exact same way. So I thought this was really fascinating and likely just an example of the attention to detail that she puts into her music. Okay, now I have one more thing to talk about here in terms of guitar technique, and it is guitar tremolo. So I think the first time I ever heard Kyuhi Park was in this video right here. Uh, she's playing the Barrios Una Limosnita, and I call it the lounge version <laughs> because it looks like she's in like a hotel lobby or, or conference lounge or something, almost as if someone was in there and was like, hey, can you play a, a, a virtuoso guitar piece and I'll record you on my camera? And she's like, oh, sure, of course. And, and so she just pulls out her guitar and, and just plays. And ever since I saw this video, she has one of my favorite guitar tremolo sounds. You know, I think guitar tremolo is, is pretty strange. And anybody that plays it on a high level, they kind of just bring their own approach to it. It's kind of like, the way that they are going to present the tremolo. And I've always just thought that she has one of the best sounds or one of the sounds that I most prefer. And the interesting thing about this shot here is that you really can't see her plucking hand. But I just always assumed it was traditional PAMI guitar tremolo because why wouldn't it be, okay? I have heard of certain players having the reputation of, well, they don't do P. AMI tremolo, they do something different, but she was not one of them. I'd never heard her mentioned in this way, okay? Now, if you look at this one shot here, there's this brief moment where she leans back and you can see more of her eye finger. And I think this is enough information to determine 
she is doing traditional PAMI tremolo because you don't see that eye finger move until you know the third note of the group of three. So that leads me to believe this is traditional PAMI tremolo. Now why am I even talking about this? Because why would you assume that she's doing anything differently? Well, I didn't until I ran across this other video of her playing this same piece, Una Limosnita. And what I saw here really blew me away because she's not doing four finger tremolo. She is doing a different pattern. So right away you can look at her right hand and it just looks different, okay? The wave that you saw before when she's doing the four finger tremolo, now this is not the wave. It looks very different. So I thought, whoa, what's she doing? Okay, so with some different angles, you can see she is doing a pattern that only involves three fingers. I did not know this about her. And it's kind of hard to tell. I'm convinced it's P-I-M-I. -I. And then when you see it at real time, the way that the first finger, it just looks like it's working double time, which it is. I mean, it's like flamenco tremolo, but with no A finger because the eye finger is pulling double duty, it's, it's working both ways. So I'm pretty sure that this is P-I-M-I -I, tremolo. So then I thought, oh my goodness, well, only a complete nerd would try and find all of the tremolo performances that she has online where you could see footage of the way that she's playing and categorize them in terms of, well, you know, these she's using P-A-M-I, these she's using P-I-M-I, -I, or who knows, maybe she's doing something different for some. So I happen to be that exact type of nerd. So I, I then went on a search to find as many of her tremolo performances as I could. And then I made two teams. So the first team, of course, is called Team Pammy, P-A-M-I, because that's for that tremolo pattern. And that means the second team is called Team Pimmy because that's P-I-M-I. So here's what I found. Uh, I found eight total performances of her playing tremolo pieces. And there are ones that span both categories, but we'll get to that in a minute. So just really quickly, let's go through what they are. As far as I could see, she never switches during a piece. She will play the whole piece, either Team Pammy or Team Pimmy. So here is a recording where she's playing, uh, this is obviously a different guitar than her Friedrich, uh, but she's playing it at a guitar shop. So this is Recuerdos, and she's playing uh, P-A-M-I, so that's one for Team Pammy. In this video, again, playing Recuerdos, and some good clear shots that show uh, she's doing P-A-M-I, so another one for Team Pammy. In this clip that we've already mentioned, uh, I can say with pretty high certainty, although I guess I can't say for sure, but I, I feel like there's enough information that, uh, you know, the ruling has been confirmed. Uh, this is a point for Team Pammy, so this is P-A-M-I. Then we have her playing this same piece, the same Barrios tremolo piece, in another video, and she's also clearly got the wave going on, so that's P-A-M-I, another one for Team Pammy. And then in this performance, this is part of a whole recital that she does, but this is Barrios, Un Sueño en la Floresta, and she's obviously got P-A-M-I going on. And then for Team Pimmy, here's that recital uh, that I mentioned earlier where she's playing Una Limosnita and she's got P-I-M-I -I going on. And then another instance of that same piece uh, here. Uh, here, she's actually playing a different guitar. I didn't notice that before. Uh, it doesn't look like the free trick. Anyway, it uh, looks like she has P-I-M-I -I going on. You don't see the wave. You see a very active eye finger. The camera doesn't get any closer than that, but to me, it definitely looks like uh, one for Team Pimmy. And then we have this a very interesting performance. <laughs> it's like a kind of like Recuerdos in a some kind of duo form, where she pretty much plays the piece and her her duo partner kind of kind of messes about here here and there. <laughs> but you can see here very clearly she's got P I M I going on, very active eye finger. So this is the third point for Team Pimmy. So out of the eight performances, 
I've found five instances where she's playing for Team Pammy, P-A-M-I, and three instances in which she's playing for Team Pimmy, P-I-M-I. So very interesting, the choices, because out of the eight instances, three times she played P-I-M-I tremolo, but she also plays those same pieces at other times with P-A-M-I tremolo. So who knows what these choices are based on, but I think that's just absolutely remarkable. You know, it would be amazing enough to have one tremolo technique, you know, one way to say, yeah, I can play the tremolo music that I want. I can say what I want to say. It sounds incredible. But she definitely takes things even a step further. So that is all of the guitar playing instances that we're gonna talk about here, but I have one more thing for you. And you know, when I'm studying for these videos, I'm on the lookout for anything. So I never know what I'm gonna find. And I found this moment that just really struck me. And as soon as I saw it, I thought I have to put this in the video and I have to put it at the end because I think this is really important. Maybe not for everybody but it might be more important than you think. So in this video, she's playing the Hinastera Sonata. And here's how she ends the piece. She does everything she needs to do. All the energy, all the aggressiveness, but then you can see her let go. It's like she's zapping back to reality. She's leaving the place that she had to be in to be that freak of nature to play that music. And now she's coming back to reality and her reaction to me, I describe it as humility. There's almost a look of, it's like borderline sorrow on her face. And it's one of the most interesting things that I've ever seen. But these types of things, they will just pass you right on by. You have to stop and make a point to see them and to say, hmm, well, that's not really typical. I don't usually see people do that. You know, I haven't seen people do that in that piece before. Why is she doing that? It can be very valuable to think about. And I think, you know, out of all the footage that I watched of her play, this is probably the most amazing thing that I saw. So that is all that we're going to talk about here. Thank you very much for watching this video. Uh, again, in the description, I have probably all the links that you will need to find, uh, all the links to the full performances of these videos, and uh, certainly go there and, and enjoy her wonderful playing. That's stuff that I can't really use a lot of here in this video. I wish I could. I have a playlist of these technique analysis videos there as well if you want to check out some other people that we've covered. And I'm always open to suggestions for people to cover in the future. If you want to support, I have an online community called the A Guitar Community. Right now, it's over on Patreon, uh, although it may be moving around in the future. Uh, I'll leave a link to that as well. And then I'm also a guitar composer. And it looks like I have accidentally left my pieces on my website for free. Oh no, I've got to do something about that. Well, just in case I forget again, um, that's where you can find my works. Uh, it looks like I accidentally left them up for free. So uh, there'll be a link to my website where you can find those if you want to check them out. Thank you very much for watching and have a wonderful day.